So what do my grandfather, Walter Kepner, and the rice diet, Nathan Pritikin and, and salt and fat have to do with one another? By the end of this video, you'll actually know I kind of piece this together a, a little bit, kind of like I've been doing with a lot of my videos. And it was really off a video that I saw that Christopher Walker, uh, you might not know the name right offhand, but he was uh, like he was uh, talking about poop and stuff like that back like two, three, four, five, whatever years ago. Uh, Umzu, I think, was his uh, supplement, and for whatever reason, it started pushing his videos into my uh, YouTube feed, and I started watching some of his videos. One of the things that actually got me started into wanting to make this video. Happened about three weeks ago, I think it was now. I took my body temperature. I think I mentioned it in the last video. I took my body temperature. Now, I'm going to talk about the rice diet, Walter Kempner, Nathan Pritikin, and all that kind of stuff. I just kind of wanted to give an idea of why I'm talking about this. So I took my body temperature a little while ago, and it was like 97.2 or 3, the beginning of this. I have it actually written down here somewhere. It doesn't matter. And I measured it the other day and it was 97.9. And I'm like, I got to make this video because it, it has to do with salt, the demonization of salt. And I'm starting to really look into what we're demonizing, what we're uh, praising and everything like that. And I think this this channel is going to be more about the truth and kind of stuff that Robert Kennedy's talking about uh, than anything else because I've implemented some of this stuff, some of the stuff that even uh, Durian Ryder and Freely used to hate on. And I'm like, eh, you know, like they were always skinny. I mean, come on, the 40 pound weight loss. Like I can't, t I, I can no longer really take advice from somebody who's lost 40 pounds, but kind of was skinny already. And some of them actually the 40 pounds, I'm like, you look better beforehand. So <clears throat> I wanted to look into, uh, I got my notes here. So low salt and body temperature. And I found some things that are kind of t contradictory of what they're actually talking about. So let's get into that. These results do not necessarily indicate any sort of causative role of salt consumption and high blood pressure. The results seen are typically so minimal that it becomes obvious to a scrupulous eye that there's a lot more intricate story here at play. For example, the Department of Health and Human Services funded an 11 trial salt restriction study executed by the Cochrane Collaboration in 2004. This demonstrated an average of just a 1.1 millimeter mercury drop in systolic blood pressure and a 0.6 millimeter drop in diastolic blood pressure with salt restriction in healthy humans. This is basically going from 120 over 80 to 118.9 over 79.4, results that could easily be achieved any number of ways. However, the headlines in popular media outlets chimed out the bells that salt causes high blood pressure, further perpetuating the myth in the public's mind and within the medical community, while continuing to ignore highly contradictory results from other wide-scale population studies, such as the InterSalt study of 1988, a data-driven collection of results from 52 international research centers that demonstrated that the highest salt-consuming individuals who consumed up to 14 grams of salt per day actually had lower blood pressure levels on average than people who consumed half that amount. The results of the 2004 government-funded Cochrane study and ensuing media attention became even more tenuous when you understand that the fact that the Cochrane Collaboration had conducted a study just one year prior in 2003 reviewing 57 salt restriction trials and concluded that there is little evidence for long-term benefit from reducing salt intake. A large study done in 1995 on 3,000 people over four years led by Dr. Michael Alderman and published in the journal Hypertension demonstrated that individuals who ate less salt indeed actually had a higher prevalence of increased mortality rates than those who ate more salt. They also found that by adding more salt to your diet, the subjects had a 36% decrease in heart-related mortality events. Three years later in 1998, the Alderman team published another set of findings on a 22-year-long study they've been conducting with over 11,000 people that showed a clear inverse relationship between salt intake and mortality. In basic biochemistry, it's well understood that the breakdown of ATP to ADP plus phosphate is required for the cell to use glucose and oxygen in order to maintain homeostatic functioning of the body's core metabolic processes. This breakdown to ADP and phosphate cannot happen without the presence of adequate sodium in the fluid around the cell. The more sodium present in this fluid, the better the cell is able to increase its energy consumption, which leads to more CO2 production, fueling your metabolism properly and balancing the effects of intracellular calcium. When unchecked by sodium and the resulting lack of CO2 production, calcium can exert toxic effects on the cell, causing premature cell death. All these compounds must be present in healthy levels in order to ensure the proper functioning and movement of ions through ion channels on the membrane. Put simply, you need sodium, badly. There, there's something called hypo, hypon, uh, 
hyponatremia. And you're seeing that right now. And so I wanted to look into this because if your salt intake is actually too low, your body temperature is also going to be low. And if your body temperature is also low, you are not going to be in a very good fat burning state. And if I talked about the uh, woman who was standing next to me the other day uh, after I took her photographs at the, the park and I could feel heat radiating off of her and she was so skinny. And it just it reminded me actually of, of making this uh, this video as well because she was just, I mean, radiating, radiating heat. So then there's several studies in mice and humans suggested that high salt intake may contribute to uh, thermogenesis and temperature regulation in cold regions. And in turn, cold temperatures uh, may also drive high salt intake. Low sodium levels, hy hy hyponatremia, can contribute to low body temperature hypothermia, especially in severe cases as the body ability to regulate temperature can be affected by the electrolyte imbalances like low sodium. This is because sodium plays a role in maintaining uh, proper fluid balance within the body, which is crucial, crucial for heat regulation. Now, if you guys have been watching me long enough, you'll know that I did for Lent in 2022, I did 40 days, you know, cause Lent is 40 days. I did 40 days, 40 nights, uh, of raw vegan and I did lose 30 pounds in that 40 days but I was freezing the entire time and what is really low in that diet is sodium now I came off that diet all I did was add uh, rice back in rice and potatoes that's it and my weight leveled out and it started going up and I'm like doing maybe we don't actually process starch that well when we don't have salt in our diet now I didn't look that up because that just occurred to me but that might be a possibility and if you really think about it not I'm thinking about saying that salt is very heavily used in Asian cultures another a couple of things that I found on the same low body temperature thing it was kind of a, a huge study so several uh, studies in mice and humans have suggested a high uh, salt intake may contribute to thermogenesis and blah 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 an early study has reported that cold exposure led to elevated salt intake which in turn induced non-shivering brown adipose tissue thermogenesis in mice indeed the association is supported by a recent meta-analysis that has shown that people living in cold climates consume higher amounts of salt. Historically, the increase in salt intake was believed to be attributed or, or attributable to the use of salt as a food preservative. However, these epidemiological studies point towards an inverse relationship between a cold ambient temperature and salt intake, highlighting the possibility that increased salt consumption may be physiologically necessary for the body to gener generate more heat in order to effectively adapt to a cold environment. Now, it does go on to say, and I didn't copy and paste that, and I couldn't even tell you that if this was Pub PubMed, uh, what, <laughs> which study this was, but they did go on to say that some of the rats were completely like ripped the ripped version of rats and humans they found that a lot of salt intake actually helped thermogenesis and they in turn lost weight but then they also found the inverse of that so what would cause that they didn't find the result and basically by the end of this one that i just read from they didn't have an answer to anything really so it was it was kind of you know pointless really so salt overload and insulin sensitivity so now here's another one that contradicts itself insulin resistance is, is defined as a condition in which insulin uh, actions are attenuated in i'm assuming it's how you say it in insulin sensitive target is uh, tissues and is commonly associated with hyper uh, insulinemia the pathogenesis of IR is a complex and not as uh, and has not been fully understood, but obesity increased adiposity is one of the major risk factors for IR. The effects of dietary salt intake on insulin sensitivity remains controversial. Some studies show that high salt intake induce, induces IR and that reducing salt may improve insulin sen sensitivity, while others show the complete opposite. And I'm going to get to that because I feel like I understand understand why that might happen uh, and I'm going to talk about that in a couple seconds however there's a couple other things I wanted to show in this video and that is going to be right now
At this point, I think it might be helpful to take a moment and clearly define what salt actually is in order to better enrich your understanding of how important it is to your health. So just think back to high school chemistry class when you learned about ions. Uh, you probably remember an anion and a cation and learning about those, uh, but at least in my experience, they were, they were always coupled with anxiety-inducing equations and even final exams. Cations are ions with a net positive charge. They have more protons, which are positively charged, than electrons, which are negatively charged. Now, anions are simply ions with a net negative overall charge. They have more electrons than protons. Easy, right? I mean, an ion itself is really just an atom or a molecule that carries an electrical charge. Our bodies are like big organic magnets. The principles of electromagnetism apply to us, just like they apply to the U-shaped polar magnets we used to play with as kids to grab metal paper clips off the ground. Every second of every day, millions of imperceptible ionic reactions are taking place inside you. They're vitally important to your survival. If they all stopped happening, even just for a second, you would die on the spot. A salt then is quite literally a chemical compound that's created when a cation and an anion are attracted to one another uh, due to opposing charges. And by combining through a chemical process, they actually become a net neutral charge. Let's take table salt, for example, NaCl. The cation, sodium, carries a net positive one charge. The chloride carries a net negative one charge. Combine them together and boom, you have table salt with a net neutral charge. Since naming conventions indicate that the cation must be first and the anion second, it's common for people to refer to salt simply by using the cation, like sodium. However, it's important to know that there can be many different types of sodium-based salts, and the same is true with other cations such as calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Salt itself is so essential to the human body that saltiness is one of the five classifications of perceptible taste by taste receptors on the tongue. And it's so essential to life in general that it's actually the main mineral constituent of ocean water and a huge part of the Earth's crust, especially underwater where hydrothermal vents in the oceanic crust, basalt, continually pump minerals into the ocean from the Earth's surface. All right, so this, this is what leads us to what I think is actually happening because in a lot of these studies you know they talk about so here's the cochran study they basically said that they found absolutely no real reason uh, as you saw in the video to lower and then here's another one so here's another one out of pubmed and this one basically states the same thing dietary sodium and cardiovascular health in hypertensive patients the case against universal sodium restriction taken together these data uh, these data provide no support for the notion that either normal tensive or hype hypertensive uh, individuals should routinely decrease or increase dietary sodium intake. There's really no basis to actually lower salt. And I, I will get to the rice diet in a second. I really just, I want to keep uh, kind of talking about this. The two things that I did find that might be the culprit, and I don't know has actually been tested, but I did look this up. So potassium is a part of salt, right? So I wanted to look into what sodium actually includes and what they use in, uh, you know, like processed foods. All right. So table salt, sodium chloride is the most common type of salt used in, in processed food. It's used to enhance flavor, texture, and preserve packaged foods. Now, Sodium chloride is the only thing in this salt that they are using. However, the body likes potassium to be the higher. A good potassium to sodium ratio is less than or equal to one, which is uh, achieved by consuming less than 2,000 milligrams of sodium and more than 3,510 milligrams of potassium per day. The ratio is believed to be optimal for maintaining cardiovascular health. I have found in this search, a lot of places are saying like 8 to 10 grams of salt a day is vital. And if you really think about it, like a lot of these people are drinking uh, distilled, like we're electrical beings, like everything in our body, we're like uh, superconductor, you know, like conductors, you know, like semiconductors sorry we're like semiconductors so we we conduct electricity everything in the body is, is is electric and if you are lowering your electric balance you are uh, intake you're going to have to take that from somewhere and it's going to come from your bones and all hard hard parts of your body that are structural and that's why a lot of people are like like this and they have no water hardly in their body anymore by the time they're dead because it's pulling all this stuff from the body and it's it's not in the mitochondria can't work correctly and and, and another thing that people are drinking the dis 
distill, distilled water these days. Now, truly distilled water doesn't actually conduct electricity because it doesn't have any minerals in it. Mineralized water conducts electricity. So do you really want to drink essentially dead water? People who are drinking distilled water are drinking dead water. You can't actually, from what I, from what Peter Rogers, MD, told me, you can't actually, get, you shouldn't actually give uh, children young children distilled water because it actually can kill them from what he told me. Like, I didn't look into that, but this is what a doctor of, however, you know, 30 some years told me. To the point, if people are, not people, if companies are only using sodium and you are not getting potassium from that, but your body tastes sodium. Now, I did look this up too. There is a difference in taste apparently between, um, so here's here's the other thing. So no sodium chloride does not contain potassium. However, there are several ways that potassium and sodium chloride are related. So this is this is the next one. Yes, while potassium uh, while both potassium and sodium can taste salty, most people can taste a distinct difference between them. With potassium having a slightly bitter or metallic aftertaste compared to this, the clean saltiness of sodium, making it less desirable as a complete salt sub substitute this is because they activate different taste receptors now this just brought up another thing in my head if you have potatoes generally they'll have a little bit of a metallic taste and a little bit of a bitter taste so and, and potatoes contain a lot of potassium however this isn't the point so the point of this is is sodium tastes way better or uh, somewhat better than potassium. They're not going to use potassium in foods that they're trying to get you to eat more of. And uh, salt is usually associated with fatty foods. And a lot of people put salt on potatoes, I think, to kind of counteract the potassium that's in it. And uh, one of the things is, because I don't actually like salt, so this video is like almost hard for me to make. But one of the things that I have always noticed about potatoes is they taste metallic to me. And it's probably because all, well, they taste like salt to me. Like I can taste salt, like a salt lick. Like I just had a salt lick uh, after I eat potatoes. And it's probably because of this potassium thing. There's an, another thing, and then I'm going to uh, get to the uh, the reason that I'm calling out the rice diet on this. Here's another thing. So zinc and hypertension. Now, they're trying to blame sodium for hypertension, but if you're eating sodium in an unbalanced state comparatively to potassium, that's going to throw you off, and zinc is also well known to not be in our soils anymore. So if you're not getting a lot of zinc, the lack of zinc and potassium and magnesium comparatively to the, to the uh, amount of sodium is going to cause issues a lot, uh, uh, along with not having calcium. So if you don't have all of those, you're going to be in a weird mix of uh, minerals, basically. And that's going to cause you, again, to leach from your bones and, and all that kind of stuff to try to make up for it because the body's not stupid and the body knows that it needs all these things. And a lot of people will, and I think what's happening, and I think why people, because I do kind of believe in calories in, calories out, especially when you're eating potato chips. A lot of people, I think what is happening is the body tastes it, feels like it's salt, so it wants more, but it's trying to find potassium to kind of counteract the, the sodium that you just ate. And it wants you to eat something that has sodium in it, but you're eating more chips. And it's a, a, it's a terrible balance. And then it's like, well, this I know has potassium in it, so it tells you to eat that, but it might not have as much potassium as you really think. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's a constant back and forth. And I think that's what's happening. I, I think that's what always happens. I think that's why we over nutritionize ourselves, that and our leptin issues and everything and ghrelin and, and leptin, which I, is kind of related to this, but I'm not going to talk about it in this video. And actually, uh, sodium, a high amount of sodium is, is known to act, uh, you know, mess up the leptin ghrelin cycle. But then they said it also can help it. So it's like all of these studies are just like, why'd you bother? <clears throat> but man, 18 minutes into this. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you. So this is kind of where I'm coming from with this. I'm going to show you why that I wanted to talk about the rice diet. And that's from that video that I just showed, or part of the video that I just showed you. And here's why. At the same time, Walter Kempner, a Duke University scientist who had fled Nazi Germany during World War II, began developing and testing a novel dietary protocol for decreasing blood pressure with a strict focus on white rice and fruit intake. 
The lack of salt consumption in his diet protocol quickly led to discussions in the medical literature about salt's role in hypertension. And the popular sentiment quickly led to physicians accompanying their prescriptions of the aforementioned diuretic drugs alongside a recommendation that the patients also eat a low salt diet for maximum effectiveness of the diuretic effect, since diuretics chiefly act to excrete sodium in the urine. Salt restriction, however, is extremely damaging to the prenatal development of the fetus in the womb, and it became well known by more discerning scientists and physicians that these recommendations, especially to pregnant women, would lead to a widespread damage to millions of newborn children. So my grandfather, the reason I'm mentioning my grandfather is because he died in 2010. He was in his 80s. He died, I, for whatever reason, they had to do an autopsy. And when they did the autopsy, they, they found that all of his ner uh, veins and nervous system and heart and everything were in perfect working order. And the reason I mentioned him is, guys, I could literally see, like, he used to literally, I don't know how somebody does this, put an entire spoon full of salt on every meal. And I, I, he, would, he could literally just take... And he wasn't a fat guy at all. He had it. I I remember him because he he always had suspenders on because he had no weight on him. So as you can see, Dr. Walter Kempner, rice diet guy, I talked about a lot. Probably the contributor to the reason that we think that sodium is uh, is needs to be coming out of the diet, uh, even though Alderman and all these other people uh, that he talked about that I, I don't even think I found slides for him. All right, so it says, we saw no evidence that a diet lower in sodium had any long-term benefit, uh, beneficial effects on the blood pressure. Our findings add the growing evidence that current recommendations for sodium intake may be misguided. These long-term data from the Framing Framingham study provide no support for lowering sodium intakes among healthy adults to below 2.3 grams per day as recommended. These studies, uh, the study does support the finding of a clear inverse association between potassium, magnesium, and calcium, and the blood pressure change over time. Okay, so that's kind of what I was just talking about. And then you got a confounding with the rice diet, Walter Kempner, and him talking about how you shouldn't have very... I mean, he had some of his people, I think, on like 100 milligrams a day of salt. And I think that's stupid. And a lot of his people never actually lost a good amount of weight. They were healthyish weights, but most of them didn't want to actually do more. And he had some of his people walking like 20, 25 miles a day or something, some crazy number. And I, I think it was the, the lack of salt actually a messes. And I'm going to talk about that in a different video because this one's already 20 minutes somehow. Uh, the lack of salt actually affects your thyroid. So, of course, his people were... I don't know how he didn't see some of this stuff. So, that brings up Pritikin. I think... And I'm going to show a, a short video here. Uh, you know what? Let me just show this short video right now. ...them without food any longer. But in the American diet, where one fat meal follows another every six hours, everybody has blocked vessels all the time. When Dr. Quo, Peter Quo, a cardiologist in Philadelphia at that time, decided to see if Swank's experiments work on his angina patients. He invited 14 angina patients to his office, took some blood samples, the blood was reasonably clear, taped them to electric cardiographic equipment, no coronary insufficiency, and then gave them a glass of heavy cream. And it only took four to five hours when the fat and the cream poured into the bloodstream to block enough vessels so that he registered 14 cases of angina. The electrocardiogram confirmed the angina. The blood samples had five times as much fat as when he started. And when Dr. Williams did his work, he was able to confirm that the small vessels of the eyes that were completely open before the cream drink, after the cream drink, many vessels were closed, just like in the hamster study. And when Dr. Crow did this test again, a short time later with the same angina patients, gave him another drink. This time, there was no fat in the drink. Just protein and carbohydrates, but the same amount of calories and the same amount of bulk. And this time, five hours after the test, the blood had no additional fat in it, the electrocardiograms were all completely normal, and there wasn't a single angina attack. I actually think that what Walter Kempner ran into was like kind of like how people found like that 3M tape 
you know, like the, the sticky stuff. That the, the person who was in, trying to invent a glue was trying to invent the stickiest, like the most hardcore, like gorilla glue that you've ever seen in your life. But what he actually formulated was the one from the, you know, the, the sticky notes, you know, that you can put on and take off. That's what the glue that he actually invented, which was a happy accident. And I'm sure he wasn't very upset that he actually did it. But I think what Walter Kempner did was discover the fact that these people, these angina attacks and these renal disorders that these people were having wasn't coming from the salt intake. It was coming from not having the fat in the diet. Because it doesn't make sense to me that a lot of his clients, they never really got all the weight off, even with all the crazy stuff that he had them doing. You know, the one woman wanted him to spend, you know, I guess he was a good looking guy. So, I, I, you know, in Ger German people having uh, weird things, uh, fetishes and stuff like that. So I, I don't know if that had something to do with it, but like spanking this woman and, uh, you know, so, some really weird stuff going on. He talked about the diet was more fun uh, to talk about than do. And then I'm thinking about the con study where they literally had those. Not, I know there was only two people, but there's other studies like the con study where Actually, uh, the was it the Netherlands? I think it was during World War II. Is basically the con study uh, across millions of people, but they had them on like eighteen hundred calories a day just of fat, plus however many potatoes they wanted to eat. It was basically a French fry diet, and they still, especially the woman, the woman couldn't keep weight on. So I don't, you know, and I'm not, uh, you know, advocating for a, a you know. Uh, the french fry diet but i am saying that i think what he accidentally discovered was the fact that these angina attacks weren't happening anymore because he didn't have fat in these people's diets anymore it, i don't think it was a salt at all because if you take out these these minerals there's a lot more harm than good and i've actually raised my body temperature almost a degree 0. 0.6 0. 0.6 of a degree in less than a month by adding salt back in. And I'm a person who doesn't even like salt. I don't like the taste of it. I can still taste it. Uh, and I had it like, I don't know what time it is, but like eight hours ago. That is my conclusion to this video. I think the rice diet is somewhat good, but I think some of his tactics were absolutely stupid. Like I just, the, it, it always bothered me reading some of the stuff about the rice diet and how a lot of his people despite still having to walk like eight to 10 miles a day, couldn't really get all the weight off. And I'm like, well, they're tanking their hormones. But I, he had to have known this because he I, he kept blood records. I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe he didn't want to look into it. I don't think Pritikin was really around quite yet, but some of the studies that Pritikin act, you know, accessed were around... I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I don't play one. Wouldn't want to be one. But that is my findings in this one. Um, look into it for yourself. I'm not advocating for people to start, you know, dumping an entire salt shaker. And here's the thing. Last thing. Should have said this in the beginning. Sea salt has a lot of minerals in it, like 52, 53, 54, depending on which sea salt you get. Sodium chloride, table salt. Is sodium chloride, and it's really not that good for you. These things over here, the you know the potassium, magnesium, calcium, zinc, all that that's in sea salt. If you're gonna use salt, use the whole form, because the partial form, you know, is not good. <laughs> like you need that potassium sodium uh, balance. I I always, so all of this kind of clicked into my head, and that is how they all relate. And that is my, I cannot believe how long this video took to get ugh, spit out, but hopefully it did some good. Share the video because YouTube's not sharing the videos for me. So please help me out. I do this stuff for free. Uh, if it keeps going like this, where I'm like struggling to get views, I'll just take my stuff somewhere else. I'm not going to keep doing this. So share the video. Uh, you know, I'm certainly not doing this for the money. <laughs> like, and so I can go at any time. Uh, so share the videos and I'll show myself the door if it keeps going like this because it's just, it's just blocking everything I do. Uh, anyway, uh, like, subscribe, talk to you in the next one and share the video because 
YouTube's not doing that. Anyway, talk to you in the next one.